Atlas uh, Cloud in uh, Germany, the other one's in New York City uh, on DigitalOcean. Both of them are reasonably the same, um, as much as I can make. Uh, the uh, Hetzner Cloud server is 16 vCPU um, and uh, 32 gigs of memory. I'm just giving you some stats so you know the difference in the machines. And then the DigitalOcean is uh, 16 gigs of memory and uh, 16 vCPU. Uh, both of them have SSD drives. Uh, the reason why I picked the Hetzner cloud um, server to demonstrate part of this was uh, when people use remote desktop systems, one of the hardest things to overcome is uh, uh, distance, you know, the delay uh, in, uh, for video and things like that. So I uh, put the Hetzner cloud in the mix just so you can see what it's like uh, transatlantic remote desktop capability. Um, uh, this uh, CIAB first started quite a while ago. Um, I was given the opportunity to uh, uh, work at a local nonprofit that uh, manages the North Carolina Regional Education Network. And I got to visit a lot of the K through 12 schools. And it was pretty obvious after visiting a uh, half dozen or so of those schools that they all had the same problems. They had little or no technical expertise. Uh, they had all kinds of different kinds of equipment. Some of it old, new, broken uh, windows, Apple, Mac, uh, Chromebooks, you know, constant virus threats, et cetera. So I started thinking about, well, how can you help some of these schools solve some of this? So uh, uh, I started to build up this concept of uh, a cloud in the box uh, remote desktop system uh, using guacamole, uh, Tomcat, MySQL. Well, you can read the components here. And then uh, I used LXD uh, containers for quite a while. So I uh, made use of those in this architecture. And I'll explain why that became important in the overall concept. Uh, guacamole supports several protocols. I use RDP because uh, I chose it over using VNC for a couple of reasons. Uh, RDP is encrypted. It has reasonably good performance. It's the default for Windows, and so it's widely used. And uh, because XRDP in the Linux world uh, supports the RDP protocol for Linux, I could set up guacamole to where um, I had servers that were Windows servers and uh, Linux servers, uh, excuse me, uh, and Linux servers for uh, user connections. And uh, it would be the same protocol to all of them. Now, um, in uh, guacamole, or the, the connection to guacamole from your desktop is uh, just any, HTML5 browser, uh, Chrome and Chromium seem to work the best. Uh, Firefox, I've had hits and misses sometimes with Firefox, depending on what version I'm using. Uh, but the idea was uh, you put uh, the cloud-based uh, remote desktop system uh, out somewhere where all the students or teachers, or in the case of businesses, it can be different divisions, uh, or in the case of uh, universities, it can be different colleges. Um, they could all have their unique connections and it's all encrypted because it's uh, HTTPS uh, across the internet from wherever they are to uh, the cloud server. Then it's the only place where it's exposed to RDP is uh, on the container network, which is a 10 dot network. So it's not routable. It's not normally accessible to the internet. The only thing that runs in the, the cloud server itself is the LXD daemon. And uh, that's managing uh, several containers. LXD containers are different from Docker in that they run a full Linux distribution. So, uh, in the Linux containers, I could have Fedora, CentOS, um, uh, SUSE, Debian, et cetera. Um, I haven't used Ubuntu, so I stick with what I know. Um, 
by default, all of these LXD containers are unprivileged, which means that uh, uh, the UID GID of a user in the container uh, is, is not the same as that same user out in the host. So uh, the root in the container is not the same as root in the host. So that's a security concern a lot of people try and understand early on. Uh, I tried to build the CIB to where it had very minimal security exposure. Like I said, nothing runs in the server host except for the LXD daemon and uh, no ports are open in the host except for port 443. And all the remote desktop connections are via HTTPS. Um, we'll see some of this a little bit later, but I've got uh, not just the user desktops, but I built a, a little manuating system where the admin can install various um, web applications that uh, I'll show you in a little bit, a list of those as well. But again, all those web applications are accessible only from the LXD desktops that are running in containers and only on that 10 dot network. So they can't be accessed from the internet, um, but users of uh, the desktops uh, in the containers can access the internet. It's just, you'd have to be logged into one of those desktop uh, systems first. Uh, by the way, interrupt me if anything comes up you want to ask a question about. Um, these uh, LXD containers, uh, much like Docker, share the host's uh, kernel, uh, except for LXD, has, their containers have their own init and uh, system D. Uh, they do run the full uh, desktop, uh, the full distro system. LXD supports a lot of different file systems, GFS, BTRF, uh, LBM, Ceph, uh, can do snapshot and restores. Um, you can manage with the LXD daemon uh, and its uh, protocol capabilities. You can use LXD on one system to start, stop, delete, uh, copy, clone uh, containers on another system, system remote system. Some of the distros that are pre-built on a daily basis for LXD are these. There's, there's more, but I couldn't fit them all on the screen. But there's quite a few. So I can have my Ubuntu home system uh, running CentOS, uh, Fedora, Gen2, et cetera, in LXD containers if I need to work in those environments for whatever reason. This is uh, just a kind of component view uh, access to the remote desktops via HTML5 web browser. Um, upper right hand corner, uh, or upper right corner, uh, the remote desktop LXD containers. Uh, we only have one on this server, uh, CM1, but if I needed more, I could just copy the CM1 container to CM2 in, in about a minute or two minutes, maybe. Uh, I'd have a second container with just as much capability as the first. And I could also copy that to a different host, so I had a different uh, host uh, for that container. Uh, the desktop I've got that I install is uh, Mate, um, but uh, I've got several others in the scripts that do all the installation. Uh, there's also, um, uh, there's two other ones, XFCE and uh, Budgie, but you could install any desktop that you want. Um, I have these uh, web applications that I'm uh, making use of Bitnami and uh, they uh, gave me some ideas of how I could uh, automatically install uh, their applications. So uh, the admin for CIB uh, can install about 23 different Bitnami uh, applications that I picked um, just for general usefulness. And uh, um, when you install those, each of those web applications gets installed in its own LXD container. So it's isolated from the other LXD containers. It can also be copied uh, to another server by the admin um, 
or cloned to make more copies of it. Maybe you want, got different divisions and you want three divisions to have the same application, but you don't want them to mix their data. Um, and uh, let's see, let's keep going here. Um, these are just some of the areas of the web applications that are installable. Um, I tried to pick a good variety. And um, these are just in, in the specific application categories. I list some of them that uh, I've got. Now installing these, it's, it's just a point and click and uh, takes, I don't know, maybe four to five minutes per application. And that's to uh, create the container, install uh, the uh, application in the container and then reboot it, you know, with it's, whether it's got Apache or Tomcat or whatever in it as well. Uh, but I've got a lot of things here that are useful in a general purpose for people. Uh, one of the reasons why I like this idea of the cloud-based desktop for, uh, was that you can, like, for instance, on Amazon or Pretzner or DigitalOcean, you can start off with one size server, um, make an image from that server uh, after you get it configured, and then later you can, or a snapshot of it, and then later you could create a bigger server that has more vCPU and uh, more RAM and more storage if you need to uh, continue to build up. And on Amazon, I think, well, I haven't looked in a while, but 96 vCPU uh, used to be one of the largest you could get with two 900 gigabyte um, SSDs. <coughs> but the cost can scale up and down. And the idea with the schools, and this, this idea went beyond schools, but the idea with schools is uh, schools could scale up the number of servers they have for grade one through three uh, in the morning, scale it down in the afternoon and not be paying for it uh, as uh, uh, kids come or go from their classes. Uh, collaboration, social media. Uh, the ITOP is a CMDB application that's uh, fairly useful. It uh, uh, can do an inventory and uh, uh, application management, but just some more tools that are in this that you can install. Oops. Uh, now for the two servers, as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the servers and it's, uh, uh, let's see, Oop, that IP address is wrong. Sorry, I'd have to go back to the beginning. But I made uh, the uh, 25 login IDs and passwords on both servers. Uh, they're all, the password and the login ID are gonna be the same. So CIB1, you use CIB1 for your password. Um, and then uh, I'll get the right IP address that's up here in a, in a minute. Um, these slides also, I got some links to where you can find some more information about these different projects. And then um, this one I just threw in because uh, I've got a second project that I built to help uh, or to work with uh, the CIB remote desktop. And that was this full mesh VPN internet overlay. This uses, uh, again, it's LXD containers for the tenant uh, compute and storage, um, using WireGuard uh, for the VPN, VXLAN, um, and BGP and BGP VRFs to help uh, uh, update traffic routes across the internet uh, so that a 10 dot network or uh, uh, whatever in say Hetzner's cloud can talk to the 10 dot network in AWS's cloud. Or uh, if, the, if this was in a multi-tenant environment, you could have where a, a tenant in any of these environments could talk to all of their uh, machines in any of the other environments as long as uh, they were configured in the same autonomous system and uh, the same VXLAN but everything still would be behind uh, or uh, behind uh, unroadable, unaccessible networks. Uh, anyway, 
the idea here in this picture, if you can picture those remote desktop capabilities, this could be a school system. It could be a, uh, an international business with different sites around the world. Uh, could be a university with multiple campuses. Um, this one just happens to fit in with that. So I wanted to show you. Um, let's see. I'm gonna find. Oops. Um, I'm gonna log into one of the servers now and then I'll just go through a couple things and then uh, I'll give you guys the IP addresses and you guys can uh, um, So this is uh, uh, the way guacamole would look after it's been configured. Um, I'm going to go into uh, the settings menu and show you a little bit about guacamole. Uh, so, Brian, it yeah. appears that you are uh, still sharing your uh, PowerPoint uh, deck uh, currently. Uh, hmm. Okay. Um, you, you probably have to stop sharing and reshare uh, onto the the object that you okay. you're you're wanting to show. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, no problem. I've been burnt by this before too. Uh, I, I do have to say I ran a speed test from inside of uh, uh, your uh, Hetzner uh, area and holy cow, they've got some high speed network connections. I got a ping of one and uh, it's a two gig down and up. Yeah, th um, that's one thing I did learn uh, in this is that um, they, uh, uh, Hetzner and DigitalOcean both have 10 gig links internally in their network, uh, but they throttle individual users to, I think it was one gig each, uh, unless you pay them more. And then, but to go outbound, uh, like from Hetzner's cloud to DigitalOcean's cloud, uh, they statistically multiplex that to where that 10, great, 10 gigabit link is uh, shared among X number of users. And so they told me that typically a user, unless they're paying special price, uh, will be limited to around 300 megabits. Uh, but it depends on how many other tenants happen to be on that same 10 gig external link. Now, can you guys see this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is uh, part of guacamole. And I'm just going to go through a few of these screens so we don't have to go through all of them. The first thing you define in guacamole are connections, and that's links uh, to servers. So this could be a Windows server. It could be a Linux server running XRDP, uh, et cetera. But let's we'll just look at one of them. Um, so you give it a name. Uh, I never change this field. I use RDP, but you've got SSH, Telnet, VNC too, but I don't use those. These are maximum number of connections that can be present on this link and then maximum number per individual user. So since it's an admin server, I figured, well, you might have two admins and they each can connect one session each. Then uh, uh, scrolling down to the network, you put in the, the 10 dot network of the container and it's uh, port 3389 because it's RDP. Um, Guacamole has a, a, a couple parameters that you can make use of in these connections. Uh, one is uh, this Guac username and the other is this Guac password. This helps you pass the username and password through to the, the actual uh, operating system that you're trying to log in on. Security, uh, for RDP, you got NLA, RDP, and TLS. I've been using RDP because it's, it's not over the internet. It's just between uh, the host and the containers uh, themselves. So it's all internal to that server. Um, Change to English keyboard, 32-bit color. Uh, this I'll explain to you in a little bit, but uh, uh, with uh, 
guacamole, you can download files from your remote desktop to your local desktop. In Linux, they'll end up being put in your uh, uh, downloads directory and uh, Windows do the same thing. And I'll show you that in a little bit, how that works. Uh, for printing, uh, printing's always been a, a bear for people with remote desktops. Uh, a lot of people use Google Cloud Print, uh, but Google's uh, stopped that, they, they, or they are stopping it. Uh, but uh, Apple uh, was a big component of CUPS, Linux CUPS. And uh, recently, the IPP protocol, the Internet Printing Protocol, got included in CUPS. With that, and I got this out of my GitHub, I got an issue uh, the documents, how you configure this. You can have, uh, say, your remote desktop out in the cloud. Uh, you can have it connect to your local printer as if your local printer was on the same LAN with the, that remote desktop. It will show up in the printing menus uh, for applications on your desktop, just like it would if you were here locally. Um, and the IPP doesn't require any, any external party uh, involved. You just have to configure uh, your uh, router to uh, set the IPP port number you want to use and then to pass any traffic on that port to your printer IP address. And almost most all uh, modern printers support IPP. And that's pretty much it for uh, the uh, connections configurations that I do. It's not anything real, really complicated. Um, for users, setting up a user is, is simple. Again, you get a username, assign them an initial password. Um, this stuff's all self-explanatory. These are permissions you want to give that user. You can let them change their own password if you want. And then you select what connections. So if you got 30 or 40 connections here, Maybe you want them to connect to all the Windows servers and, and three of the Linux servers, then you just select those and click save. Um, so if we, uh, can you see this IP address? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, if you go to that IP address and, and slash guacamole, and then just pick one of these large IPs. Small. Hopefully we got enough that it's not going to matter. Um, so I've also pasted it into the chat as well if uh, people don't want to uh, try and zoom in there. But then, uh, like I said, you pick any one of those, like CIB20, and then your password will be CIB20. And when you select that, you should be able to log in. Is there a reason you're not using uh, Let's Encrypt Cert out there? Uh, no, actually, I do normally use it, but I don't right now because I was just doing a demo. But yeah, Let's Let's Encrypt uh, works fine with this. I, you just I just install it uh, with the Nginx. Okay, thanks. I'll, also, uh, uh, Guacamole supports uh, TOTP, so uh, time one time uh, password. And to turn that on uh, and use Google's uh, authenticator uh, or one of the other authenticator systems, it, it's basically you move one file to a, a specific Etsy directory and then reboot uh, Guacamole. And it'll come up and uh, go through the process of registering the, uh, the graphic image in uh, the server with your uh, um, authenticator. Then you can use that. So then you'd have to log in with your password and authenticate with your third party tool. Now, can you guys still see my screen? Uh, yes, we're currently seeing the guacamole yep. screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm just going to show you one thing here. Now, uh, the the CIB drive, I just called it that. It could be called anything. But uh, 
if I click here, there's a download folder there. If I were to take this junket file, say it's, it might be a spreadsheet or something, and uh, uh, drop it on that download folder, that automatically downloads it to my local download folder. So that's how I can transfer files. And you can transfer files up as well. And like I said, for the printing I use, I, I would use IPP. Um, but I didn't, I didn't go through setting all that stuff up. If you click the menu button, this is mate. Uh, so I mean, you should know it all you guys. Uh, but if you go down to the internet, click uh, Chromium web browser, and maybe go to YouTube and play a YouTube music video or something just to see what the performance is. Keep in mind that uh, uh, this site, 183, is Hetzner in Germany. So whatever performance you get is uh, across the ocean and through your home network. And And also within this menu system, as with any server system, you could delete or get rid of any of these items you don't want non-admin users to work with or to use. Yeah, the, the performance on that's rather impressive, really, all things considered. I did find it interesting that it was redirecting me to uh, look like Arabic uh, advertisements for some reason. Well, because it's in Germany, it's a server in Germany. I've had that, I've had that happen too. But when we go to the DigitalOcean server, it'll be different. Um, anyway, this is uh, uh, the user interface in the nutshell. I was gonna show you uh, a little bit of the admin stuff. To log out of your desktop, it's just this button. You click menu and come down to this button in current session, log out. Now, if I go, uh, I'll have to capture this again, I guess. Uh, we're, we're seeing your login there of the, uh, the admin uh, screen. Yeah, I, I'm going to stop capturing and restart it. I was actually expecting the ads to be in German uh, since it was <laughs> a, a German server. Except they know where you are, Andy. <laughs> Let's see, I guess it'd be this one. Now, can you see a screen that has uh, uh, CIB web applications installer on the left? And yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so there's a, a another LXD tool uh, that. A guy I know in Europe uh, builds, it's called LXD Mosaic. Um, that's an orchestrator type tool for LXD. So if, if I had these servers spread all over the place, um, let me, now I'm going to forget what my login is. Yeah, I can't show. I can't remember my password and login. But this is this uh, LXD Mosaic is a, a really nice tool. It allows you to uh, create, move, copy, clone uh, LXD containers between one server and multiple servers. Um, well, forget it. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, I should have really wrote it down. Um, I haven't used this in a little while. Uh, but anyway, um, 
that allows you to also, it also supports some other facets of LXD containers that are really useful technology in my opinion. Uh, you can create uh, profiles that uh, groups belong to and those groups, when they create their LXD containers, their containers will be uh, namespace different than the containers of another project that uh, is using LXD on the same server. So you can assign a group of engineers to do one thing and whatever they're doing is never gonna affect another group. They can't even work with the other group's containers unless they're given the permissions. Um, this is what I told you about the web applications. These are the lists of applications that you can install by default. And if I were to uh, pick that one, WordPress, this takes, uh, if you've ever used uh, Bitnami before, it takes you know, three to five minutes to install an application. That's installing the um, web server, uh, possibly the Genix or MySQL, et cetera, and all the software that the application needs. Now right. here, uh, I'm gonna write this down. Uh, it's 10.33.191.2. Um, the idea here, again, was to have a set of basic, uh, basic applications that a business would use. Uh, or as you saw, uh, I've got RStudio included uh, for people working in statistics or, or uh, data analysis, um, like my son. Uh, but every application gets installed in its own container. Once it's installed once, uh, because LXD can manage containers, it can clone containers, et cetera, from one LXD host to another, uh, I could install it here and then just clone it to another server over in uh, um, DigitalOcean or wherever the other server might be. And it would be an identical uh, server to what I configured here. So that saves you a lot of configuration work. Um, if once you've installed an application like this Bitnami uh, application, you don't have to keep installing it. You can just uh, make use of the copy slash clone capability of the containers themselves. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, I'll show you some of the uh, containers here also. Um, I want to let this uh, go uh, for a second. Sorry about this. Yeah, that's perfectly all right. At least we can zoom in on, on Zoom and read it. Yeah, it is kind of small. Well, that just means you don't have a big enough uh, monitor. I'd take a 60 inch monitor to read that. This now it's installing the Bitnami application. When it's done, you guys will be able to log into uh, uh, work, the WordPress server as well. But again, when you log in, you'll be going from the web using the web browser that's on your remote desktop. You'll log into a 
address, which is also connected on the same network as your desktop, but it's not accessible from the internet. So um, all the data, again, it's more of a security thing, but all and a privacy thing, all the data and all these applications that your users would be creating, storing, et cetera, is not accessible to just anybody. It has to be somebody that has an account here and can access these uh, containers. Well, one, of things, one of the things years ago when this first started uh, that I initially envisioned it again for K through 12 type stuff was uh, I talked to a manufacturer of thumb drives back then and we could get a, a two gig thumb drive I guess for four dollars or something like that and in the initial thought for this was when kids registered for school, they come in, their parents pay $4, they get the thumb drive. Uh, the kid, when they come to school, they bring the thumb drive, they can stick it in any PC, Chromebook, whatever, and boot off of it. And when they boot it off of it, it automatically, it would be automatically configured to take them to one of these remote desktop servers and log them in because that would be like their key. Then at the end of the day, the kids, you know, whistle blows, time to go home. Uh, the kids pull the thumb drive out, take it home. And if they do have uh, uh, internet capability at home, they plug the thumb drive in, reboot again. And when it boots up, it would, again would take them back to the same desktop they were working at at school so they could finish their schoolwork, uh, transfer a report or whatever to the teacher. Uh, but it would all be uh, done remotely. And one of the benefits going back to what I originally started this with uh, was that schools are, in my mind, they're so terribly underfunded <laughs> that uh, uh, anything you can do to make it simpler to upgrade software, to manage users, um, to make it simpler um, was a good thing. And so that's, again, why here I can, I can add stuff applications to their desktop just by installing it, the application in the cloud server. Uh, nothing else has to be done. And then all the users of that cloud server um, get the new application. And if I need more power, et cetera, I just add another server or clone it. Okay, now you guys in from your desktop, assuming I copied this IP address down right, uh, to get to the WordPress uh, server, be I can't remember. I think WordPress is terrible. Unless I didn't get the IP address right. Well, here's the good part. Is it? I don't know if you can see that terminal session, but you can see WordPress is running at the bottom there. You might have to. I only see Chromium. Yeah, I just I just restarted the WordPress.
which is an awesome earlier. That's okay. It's not a good presentation if something doesn't go wrong. Yeah, I know. Everything I uh, have something screwed up. Well, I know how it works. <laughs> Take my word for it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to show you guys some of this stuff. Uh, oh, uh, the DigitalOcean uh, server. So the DigitalOcean server is this IP address, the 178.128.144.26. And this same password scheme, it's just CIV1 through 25 for a login ID and a password. Now this one uh, had half as many vCPUs, uh, 16 gigabytes of memory, so half the memory in it still an SSD drive, but it is located here in the States. Oh, the same thing, guacamole again. Were you able to log in to it? Uh, yes. Okay. Yep. So you could go to YouTube and play same video or whatever and you can kind of compare the two. Keep in mind this one's half the number of vCPUs. So this uh, should be about four core, I guess. And that was four core and seven nanoseconds ago. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many people are logged in right now either. So maybe it's just a couple of us. But I just wanted to show you the, you know, juxtaposition of the two cloud servers. One has half the hardware, but it's not as much distance to travel. And, I don't have a GUI menu on the DigitalOcean one. What's that? Uh, apparently, the the uh, top bar where you have menu there, at least on uh, user number four, it wasn't showing up as having that that button there. Oh yeah, I, that's a mate bug. And if you want to fix that on whatever one you're logged into. Just right click on the desktop and say uh, open in a terminal. And then type uh, mate dash panel space minus minus reset. So mate dash panel space minus minus reset. And then that menu button comes back. I've seen that happen before with mate. But I like it better than some of the others. Yep, that did resolve the problem. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, that's kind of all I got to show you, I guess. Um, I just wanted the opportunity to let you see what it can do. All right. Very and, cool. And Thank you. Is sharing kernel, but nothing else. Yeah. 
Well, it's just like with Docker, you, you, share, you always are sharing host's kernel. Right. So that's your one limitation. You can be using. But you also uh, don't have a bunch of. Hey, Louis, and... Gary. Hey, uh, take a snapshot of the chat session, would you? Uh, I got bounced out before I copied it. And uh, uh, so I came back in. It doesn't have the old see the chat from the beginning. I'm missing all the well, uh, well, on my GitHub, in the readme file, if you scroll down a ways, there's uh, there's a list of all the applications that are on that menu. There's also a link to two YouTube, actually three YouTube videos that I did um, for an earlier version of this, but it's pretty much the same. We're actually go through the entire installation. Uh, so you can kind of, I mean, I do cut out parts of it so you don't have to watch it all. But to install it on these servers here took me about 30 minutes. Um, and once it's installed on one, it's a little bit quicker because then you copy it to the other server. Uh, Gary, to answer your question, I'll go ahead and send you a uh, transcript of the uh, chat afterwards here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I forgot that I still had my mic open. I was actually telling Lee that, but, uh, but he hasn't responded. So, but thank you. Now, if, you if you go out to Bitnami's website, they've got I don't know, it's probably 200 different applications. Um, basically, uh, I that menu you see that I install from, I tried to make, I'm not a programmer anymore. I was at one time, <laughs> that was a long time ago. Uh, but uh, I created that menu system and there's, it's fairly simple how you can install or change the application. So if you wanted to use it, it put different, uh, Bitnami applications in there, it's easy enough to do it as well. And then, like I said, uh, if, if you want to look at uh, the GitHub uh, in the issues section for the remote desktop section, I've got, I, I don't use GitHub the way most people probably would. <laughs> In the issue section, I use that to help document uh, tips and hints. Um, that's where I've documented the IPP. Also, uh, how to how to install and and get the time one time password working. Again, that's that's idiot simple. It's copying a file from one location to another, and then restarting Guacamole. Well, anyway, I, thanks guys for letting me have the opportunity. To, show you some of this. Um, I'll leave these servers up tonight if any of you just want to play around. It's nothing nothing anybody can do with them. Have you deployed this in uh, in school systems? Have they I mean has it been pot well received? I I didn't, but I've had people that uh, I've demonstrated this to uh, in Germany uh, and uh, I think it was Guatemala or Nicaragua, I can't remember. But uh, they were using it because uh, obviously money is a big deal uh, in some countries uh, or rural areas that may not have the resources. Um, so this was an easier way to do it. I've got uh, uh, another guy that uh, he was with the largest uh, wind generation system in Canada. They're using it. Uh, and they use it to uh, log in remotely to all these wind farms in the middle of nowhere, I guess, so they can uh, reconfigure things as needed, uh, gather statistics, et cetera. Um, and then there's uh, some people from a few companies that, that have adopted it, but you know, can't really name them. I guess that's but less it's, risky like than water plants. About six bash scripts. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into installing it. Uh, as far as the knowledge, the different, you know, Pulse Audio, um, uh, MySQL, Nginx, uh, how to use like, Let's Encrypt. You know, and I'm, uh, one guy, you got to learn all that stuff. It took, took me a while to figure out how some of this stuff worked. Yeah, that's the last thing anybody works on in open source is documentation. So, <laughs> or the last thing anybody wants to work on. 
and it's always the uh, first thing to uh, go stale as well. Yeah, it's uh, well, I like that. Uh, um, what was the big security disaster uh, recently with uh, solar winds? Yeah, solar winds. The the CEO put out a statement that blamed blamed it all on a, a intern that didn't change the default password from uh, uh, Salesforce one two three. And I thought, <laughs> what are you talking about? You're the CEO of the company. You don't think it's your responsibility to make sure security is doing their job and and analyzing this stuff? You're going to blame it on an intern. You know, ruin his life forever. Boy, I tell you, some guys. And anyway, why would the uh, default password be that? You can start from scratch with the generated password. <laughs> well, that'd be one. I wouldn't even admit that was the problem. If it was so, I'd have to make up an excuse so that people wouldn't think we're total idiots. But uh, anyway, uh, it's the intern's fault for working for a company that's stupid enough to have an intern doing security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. What that's what I thought. You, you know, your intern's the last guy to check off the sale to your biggest customers. <laughs> anyway, I just uh, remember when I was an except intern. Except you got to start uh, in security somewhere. Yeah. When, when I was an intern, uh, they they told me, "Now this is the last time in your life that you'll ever be able to say it's not my fault." Yeah. Oh man, you're at all when you support. 